Thank you. Welcome, everyone. Um, you are here at a planning your garden webinar hosted by 5B Resilience Gardens. Um, your presenters today are, I am Amy Mateus. I am program director at the Sun Valley Institute for Resilience. We are the um, facilitators of this collaboration. And uh, this collaboration is a col between a handful of different members. I do hear a little bit of background noise. So if I can just remind everyone um, to please mute yourselves. Thank you for that. Um, I have been gardening here in Haley since 2016. I have a pretty small garden. It's kind of a chaotic garden. For those of you who have been in previous workshops with me, you might have seen my little greenhouse that's run by hot water. It's not going this year because we thought we were going to move. We're hoping to expand our garden with the purchase of a house here um, this spring. So I will leave it at that and pass it to Mano, who will introduce herself. Okay, I'm Manon Gaudreau. I'm originally from uh, Quebec, Canada, and um, moved here about 20 years ago. Started gardening uh, here uh, in 2010. And I wasn't gardening before that. And uh, Dick Spring was my first teacher um, of, of gardening. And since then, I've been taking a lot of training. Oh. And I was trained by uh, University of Idaho Extension as a master gardener. And I really enjoy sharing uh, my knowledge and helping other gardeners uh, get the same passion I have for gardening that I have now. Uh, I've been cooking and, uh, you know, since I'm a child and I love cooking. I, I love to preserve food, especially by um, fermentation and dehydration. And I also love composting. I've been composting uh, very successfully and generating all of my compost. I don't buy any compost. I use my own and I find it's the gold of compost. There's nothing better than that. Okay. Great, thanks Mano. So I'll go to my next slide here. Um, what is 5B Resilience Garden? So I work for the Sun Valley Institute for Resilience. And when COVID hit last year, um, we noticed a really big increase in Google searches for gardening, seeds. I'm also, uh, Mano and I run the Wood River Seed Library together, and we noticed an increase in people interested in wanting seeds, and we kind of ran out of a lot of vegetable seeds. So we realized there was a need in our community to really build a network of gardeners to support each other, to share resources with each other, to celebrate gardening, um, to really build this connectivity with all of us who do garden here or want to garden here. We know we have people who are new into our community or just starting to garden. So we really wanna give them support to have success here. We know it can be a, a tough place to garden in. So this collaboration um, includes a handful of different community members, including Wood River Seed Library, Upper Wood, Big Wood River Grange, Ketchum Rec District, Wood River YMCA, Wood River Land Trust, Sawtooth Botanical Garden, and University of Idaho Extension. So we're really um, happy to be joined in collaboration with a number of great um, organizations in our community. So um, we have a few guiding principles, like what is 5B Resilience Gardens? Um, so we chose within our collaboration to define it with these three guiding principles, food production, pollinator habitat, and soil care. Um, they, we can go into a lot more detail. We did a previous session last spring um, in those gu guiding principles and we'll be hosting a series of workshops with the Haley Public Library that this spring that will go into detail on each of those principles in their own. So all of you who are on our list will get uh, information about that in the next couple of weeks as well. We also just wanna say that this is any scale of gardening. It can be a small herb pot pot on a windowsill. It can be a multiple acre farm garden down in um, the Bellevue Triangle like we have represented here. So it's really any size. I think our stipulation is about it's not commercially for sale. You could share it with friends. You could donate it. It's just not that commercial um, scale here. And that's what we're considering gardening. Um, it can also incorporate native plants, smart use of water, mulching. All of those things are built in, but just um, putting it out there that these are some of our considerations. Um, the pollinator habitat also leads us to that limited to no chemical use. 
next slide here is um, quickly just how to get involved. And I'll also share this again at the end of our presentation. Um, we are accepting registration. So a lot of you have already registered your garden. Please register your garden if you want to join the network, um, get a garden flag, participate in future webinars, conversations, et cetera. Uh, our our follow-up email will also have a link to this because this, unfortunately, you can't click through on this slideshow. Um, so let's jump into garden planning basics. This is kind of our little agenda. There's a lot to talk about here. Um, I think we are trying to create a framework that really empowers you all to create a garden that serves your needs. So we'll go over um, know your why, growing what you like to eat, understanding your own needs and your style, knowing what grows well here, understanding your microclimates, and then how do you put it all together to actually have a gardening plan? So with uh, no further ado, we'll jump in. Okay, so the why. Knowing why you're gardening is really as important as where you're gardening, how you're gardening, what you're gardening. Because when you know your why, it really helps you figure out, you know, what size should your, should your garden be? What should you grow? What's your purpose? So I put a handful of whys here on this list. Um, I think there's endless whys. I think people can have one or two. People can have 20. So we invite you to, if you want, share your whys in the chat. Um, we'll give it a couple minutes, maybe see if we get anything coming through on the chat. Would love to hear your why. I know for me, when I was writing this list, I'm like, well, every single one of these things. Um, and that's okay to have a lot of whys. It's also okay to have your only why be that you want to grow food for your family. Um, Mano, do you want to share your why? Yeah, my first why was my first grandson was born and my daughter started a garden while she was pregnant and she was asking me questions about gardening and I thought I have to be able to talk to teach my daughter I have to be able to teach my grandkids and play with them in the garden so that that was my first why I just had to know so I could teach my grandkids and and from from there on it was oh I just love experimenting and it, I was experimenting with this and that and transforming my landscape, removing my grass and mm. my front lawn was gone. And I had a mixed uh, landscape of, you know, flowers, trees, fruit trees and, and food. And, and last year, the why changed to, oh my gosh, I have to be producing food now. <laughs> this is about, mm -hmm. and this is about producing my own food. So, so my why has been changing over the years. And I think that's what we'll probably see with a lot of people. And it seems like maybe our attendees are a little shy today. I don't see any whys in the chat. That's okay. Just maybe think about this. Um, I think it's really helpful. I know for me, when I first started gardening four years ago, I had this idea. I was going to grow whatever I could and I was going to eat everything and nothing was going to be wasted. Well, ha, ha, ha. that wasn't my reality. My reality was is that I work a full-time job and I don't have a ton of time. So things got overgrown. And then all of a sudden I realized, well, now I'm just a seed saver, right? Because if you let your lettuce grow, you eventually get seeds. So it started to turn in from wanting to grow everything I could and eat it all and consume it all to growing garden space for pollinators, for bugs, for just enjoying, for beautification, for stress relief. Um, so I think what you said, Mano, is it really changes and shifts as we grow as gardeners, as the world shifts, as our families change. And I think that's the beauty about gardening is it's ever changing. Um, okay, great. We have a couple people. Um, satisfaction of growing food, herbs, and flowers. Yes, Anne, totally agree. Oh, Rob, we could get into compost. We're not going to get into it on this. Um, we'll do a specific conversation about that because Mano has a ton of great insight. So do other members of our community. I don't think we really have time to get into it right now. Um, but maybe at the end, if we don't have a lot of Q&A, we can dive into composting because it's fun. Um, okay. I want to add another aspect to the why that's always been for me. It, it takes me outdoors. It takes me, yeah. it makes me to be in contact with nature, to squat mm -hmm. down, to breathe. And uh, it's just, it's a healthy activity. Absolutely. And, and that's been a constant and it's still that way. Mm -hmm. All right, so we'll move on to the next. 
which is a little bit more um, relatable for a lot of people. If you don't know why you have, if you don't know what your why is, you could at least answer, what do you like to eat? Um, something that I definitely have experienced in my own gardening practice is that growing things you don't like to eat is not as rewarding as growing things you like to eat. Um, so think about that. What do you eat throughout the week? Do you eat a salad every day? Um, do you never eat salads? Do you love fresh salsa? You know, um, do you always, like, I'm, I love herbal tea, so I grow a lot of herbs for my own teas. Um, is there a favorite herb that you love to grow that you love to sprinkle on everything? Um, or medicinal, so feel, medicinal yeah. herbs or flowers. Yep, absolutely. Um, even growing your own grains, right? It, maybe you're a baker and you really just want to make a fresh loaf of bread using grains you grew yourself. You can grow wheat and other grains here in your garden. Um, also thinking about how much do you eat and how often do you want to harvest it? So a lot of us talk about this as succession planting, right? So you can't really plant 50 broccoli plants and then think you're going to harvest one a week all summer long. You're going to get 50 broccoli heads all ready to go at the exact same time. So you really want to think about spacing it out. Um, lettuce is a really good way to think about this too. If you plant one lettuce head, you're going to harvest that once. But if you plant multiple lettuce heads next to each other in a couple days apart or a week or two apart, you'll have succession harvests. Um, another thing to think about too is if you're growing for like I like to use peas as an example. I love peas, probably one of my favorite vegetables. Um, you have to grow a decent amount of pea plants to actually get enough to have as a dish on a table for a family of four. So really thinking through um, those types of things to make sure that you're feeling positive with what you grow and the amount that you can harvest and eat. Because I think a lot of us have this mindset that we're going to grow everything and every meal is going to be garden fresh. And a lot of us quickly realize this is why the farmer's market is a little bit more expensive than the grocery store because growing food is hard. Um, it takes a lot of time and energy and um, experimenting to make it work. So and know if that. I want to know how, like how much, how many plants of one kind to, to grow. There are so many resources online and books available that will say, okay, for a family of four, uh, this is, you know, how many plants you have to plant. So that mm -hmm. there's, uh, there's apps on your phone. There's yeah. lots of resources to, to find out, you know, how much, mm -hmm. but when you start gardening, if you have not gardened before, garden small, <laughs> don't, go, don't garden to feed yourself 100% right from mm -hmm. the start. You start small, find out how much time you really ha do have to, to give to your garden. Yeah. And, uh, and how much can your garden give back to you in terms of food and, and satisfaction. So, and there's a lot to learn. So start small, learn a little bit at a time, and then from year to year, you can you know, increase the size and the complexity. Yeah, and that segued us really nicely into our next section of understanding your own unique style and needs. Um, so thinking about your resources here, like Mano said, how much time do you actually have? Some of us have more time than others. Some of us might have evening jobs where we could literally work in the garden all morning long, which is my favorite time to be in the garden, but I rarely get out there then. Um, some of us have full-time jobs where we work in eight to five and have kids that we deal with after work. And then maybe we have an hour or two on the weekends, right? So we all come from a different place, uh, whether it's time, money, space, material resources. So really consider those things before you jump full into gardening and rip out all your lawn and install all this stuff. And then you're like, oh, well, I really like backpacking all summer long and you're never home on the weekends, right? Um, thinking through your own schedule, your own preferences is really important. And in um, terms of costs, I, my goal was always to buy the minimum. That's why I compost so much. Uh, but I, I acquired most of my pots and even tools from the thrift store, from other people giving me things. Mm -hmm. So uh, there's a possibility there. If, and I wish we had a culture of sending our things to the thrift store when, when we don't use them instead of trashing them. I find so many tools in garbage cans on garbage day. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'll just play devil's advocate with that. If aesthetic is your thing and you love to have glitzy, glamorous, matching 
tools. You can find incredible tools at our local gardening center that are a little pricey, but they're really cute and they're really fun. And if that's what gets you out into your garden to weed, do it. You don't have to get stuff at the thrift store or reuse stuff. If what you value is that aesthetic and having everything perfect and aligned with your own style, like do and, that. Enjoy and it. There, and there are very functional tools also at the garden store. Like I'm, I'm a small person. I'm not strong. So I bought a really nice small shovel that is super light. Mm. You know, not go for a super heavy, big tool. There, there are companies that make things that are really smart and, and really light or for people who cannot bend, there are things that are made with extenders. So there are very functional things also available at our local uh, stores. Absolutely. Um, so thinking about, you know, your size, your area, are you, do you have a yard to turn into a garden? Are you maybe sharing a garden plot with some community members at a community garden space? Do you have a patio? I'm um, thinking through that and what can you actually grow? Um, in this photo, you can see Mano has a beautiful display of these potted herbs. And you could do that in a very small area. And then the photo below it is a more expansive garden down in the Bellevue Triangle, where this person has a lot of space and a lot of growing room. And they open it up and um, invite community members to come down there because it's more than what can feed them. Um, so there's a lot of different ways to utilize your land that you have available to you and think through that. Maybe for me, I know I have dogs, so it's really important that I also have a lawn for my dogs to play in. So I couldn't just convert my whole yard into a garden, even though I wish I could, right? Um, so think through that. Maybe you have kids that want to play. Maybe you love having a little putting green out in your backyard. Um, consider all those styles and your own needs when planning your garden. Um, and then also thinking about that look and design. And some of us are straight lined and really linear and like clean and everything in a row and in its place. And others of us like a little bit more chaos and everything overlapping and it's more of a jungle environment. And those are our unique styles and we can create gardens that are aligned with what we want and what brings us happiness and what we think is beautiful. And everyone's gonna be a little unique and different. Um, also to think about things like is your land that you're working with is it flat or is it sloped and depending on and we'll get into this a little bit more in the next slide but your land itself has different microclimates depending upon is it sloped or is it flat um, where does the water melt to where does it run to and also thinking about um, watering I know for me when I started gardening in the valley I did not think about watering at all and I did a lot of by hand overhead watering. And I got to the point where I was like, I can't maintain my garden if I don't automate this. Um, so I spent a bunch of time and a decent amount of money um, on drip irrigation, but it made my life a lot easier and my plants a lot happier, right? So it was, it outweighed itself to spend that little money and time installing drip because in the long run, my garden time became much more enjoyable and my plants were much happier. So those are, um, what do you think, Mano? Wanna add anything to those? Or should we talk about microclimates? Because they're very connected. Climates. Okay, great. Um, well, first we'll talk about our bioregional microclimate, <laughs> which is our high desert climate. So we, um, we have an area that gets, you know, less than 100 days of frost-free weather. It can frost in certain parts of our county thinking of up and over Galena Pass or out some of these canyons, um, it can freeze any day of the year. So we really have to think about what can grow well in our area. And the other thing is we, because we are high, our nights are really cold mm -hmm. and the summers get really uh, hot. The daytime gets really hot. The nights are, are really cold. Big difference, and it's very dry. We we get the water we get here is mostly outside of the growing season, so it's 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 very dry in our growing growing season for warm vegetables. Mm -hmm. and, and the warm season vegetables they only have about sixty days for some of us in the valley, or ninety days if we're lucky. If it's a year when we don't have frost during the summer, so. Um, it, it's, it's a challenge to grow the short season vegetables, the, the, season, the warm season vegetables, but the cool season vegetables have a good time here. So mm -hmm. in, the spring, in the spring is when we get most of our crops. 
So we have we have to start in in March planting our peas and 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 get green uh, leafy greens through through the spring because co come uh, the heat of summer, our, our leafy greens, which like cool weather, will get scorched and they they bolt and they don't like the the hot weather. So you you think about getting your leafy greens before the summer. And during the summer, you can still grow them, but you have to protect them and find ways to cool them. Mm -hmm. And um, along these lines, bioregionally acclimated seeds, I know it's a long word, but it's pretty self-explanatory of when you buy seeds or plants that are raised by local, regional farmers, commercial growers, nurseries, they're acclimated to our climate. So yes, you can order seeds from anywhere in the world or bare root trees from anywhere in the world, but the likelihood of them thriving in our unique climate is lessened. Um, so we really, we really uh, promote people sourcing from our local seed library, which is Wood River Seed Library. It's free for anyone. Um, if you wanna buy from a commercial grower, my absolute favorite is Snake River Seed Co-op. They're an Intermountain West cooperative of seed growers. Um, also shopping locally. I know Squash Blossom Farm does an amazing plant sale every spring and they use a lot of um, local regional seeds. So buying from local nurseries and local farmers, your plant starts is a great way to ensure that they are acclimated for our region. Um, and then I just threw this on there for fun because I know I always like to grow fun plants that aren't acclimated here because I don't want to have that necessary um, cutoff where I can't try something fun from Baker Creek or from Johnny. So know that you can try, it might not be as successful, but when you do try and you have those successes, um, you're acclimating seeds to our garden. So you're part of this culture of seed saving and by growing those seeds and getting them acclimated, um, you create seed types that grow better here, which is really powerful work. Um, and I also, yeah, go ahead, Mano. Something else to keep in mind is that because of our cold nights, even in the summer, our productions are, will be smaller than the production uh, in Southern Idaho or in California. So if you have a tomato plant and they say that tomato plant produces 20 pounds, well, here it might produce only 10 pounds, mm -hmm. but they may be tastier. Right. Yeah, and I think that actually leads me into this word of caution. And I just say this because I think some people in our community actually did experience this summer. Um, there were some fraudulent seeds that were shipped from nobody really knows where, probably a, somewhere in China. Um, check the reputation of your sources. Um, don't be fooled by this idea of you can buy this tomato plant that has 25 different colors of tomatoes, colors you've never seen before. There are really beautiful colored tomatoes. They're not that elaborate. Um, so just check your sources before you order seeds online because people, um, you, can, you can get invasive seeds, you can get seeds that harbor diseases for your soil. Um, it's just better to get reputable seeds from regional sources. Um, I think and, and I might've seen might... something come through the chat. I'm going to talk about quarantine. Uh, Idaho has a mm -hmm. quarantine law on some vegetables because there are a lot of vegetable growers in Idaho who grow, uh, for example, onions or uh, garlic. And mm -hmm. there's a specific disease that if, if, we, if we get that in our soil, it's in our soil for almost ever. I mean, it takes 30 years to get rid of viruses from a soil. So um, it's important to, to be sensitive to the quarantines. Are, it's not just a, oh, we like to control people. It's, it's not a control thing. It's, it's a serious thing. So make sure you plant healthy seeds. Yeah, thanks for adding that, Mano. And we did get a question in the chat about um, buying potato starts and what type of local producers do we have? I don't know all of the local seed potato producers off the top of my head. It will be something that we're working on creating a really in-depth kind of sh local shopping list for gardening supplies. So we'll try to dig in and find those potato growers. Um, this is kind of a side note, but I do know that on a commercial scale, there's a shortage of seed potatoes. So I would say um, if you find a brand that you like, I think you mentioned Teton Organics. Um, I would 
go with them because they're pretty close and local. They are organic and we don't know if there's going to be a lot of seed potatoes available coming this spring. So I would get it on it um, sooner rather than later for anyone who wants to grow potato seeds. Um, yeah, because there's definitely some shortages happening there in the commercial world. There was last, last year. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, okay, well, let's, this is about microclimates, which we talked about a little bit already, but I think this is nice to kind of um, allow you to kind of think about your own own yard, your own garden space a little bit more. I just realized it got really dark in my room. So I'm going to turn my light on quickly. But okay, so, so in, in, in your yard, there are areas that are more protected. And there are areas that are warmer than others. Obviously, your south side and your west side will get warmer um, than, than your north side. And if you have a fence that's reflective, like we see on the picture here, if when the sun reflects on that surface, or even if the sun doesn't hit it directly, that metal accumulates, or the brick or the cement, uh, accumulates heat in the daytime and radiates that heat in the evening when, when it cools down. So uh, some people have septic system. Above your septic system, there's, there's more heat. If you have more organic matter in your soil or, or uh, in a part of your garden, uh, that part is, is warmer. So I, I like to use a soil thermometer in the spring and go in different places and find the different temperatures in different areas of my garden to define uh, my climate in, in terms of how warm it gets. But you also have to consider wind. The wind cools and the wind dehydrates. So it's good to find places that, or, or devices that will protect from, from the wind. And uh, if you don't have protection in some areas, well, you plant your hardy plants there, not plants that need protection. Yeah, thank you for that overview. And I think I just add like, it was kind of said already, but we can make our own microclimates. Um, season extension, like a greenhouse, a hoop house, a you know, gallon jug of milk with the top cut off upside down, all of those are creating microclimates. So the microclimate could be protecting it from the rain or from the freezing or from the sunshine. Um, those are the ways that we create our own microclimates. Um, so you can also think about that in your garden design. Um, if you're starting from scratch, you can design around trellises to create shade and beds to maybe grow those leafy greens in the summertime, right? Um, so there's a lot of ways we can create microclimates of our own. And then we also have to work with the ones that are existing in our yard. And we, we had some questions. Um, people sent in questions before the workshop and asked about how, how do you prevent animals from eating your crop before you mm -hmm. eat? Obviously the wildlife like to eat the same vegetables that we like to eat. And we grow things that are tender and sweet and moist and, and they like that too. So we have to plan for that also in, uh, in our planning. We have to think about fencing and know that you need 7.5 feet of fencing if you want to stop deer, because deer can climb over, you know, six foot fence <laughs> and jump over. Uh, even someone has seen a moose jump over a, a, a six foot fence. Um, so, but uh, I, my garden is up front and I'm not gonna put a big fence in front of my house. So I leave it open, but there are other ways to protect. Like I use chicken wire to protect specific plants. Mm -hmm. but oh, you, have, you have to cover the top and the sides as well. Right, and if you're gonna be putting in raised beds and maybe you have voles or ground squirrel issues, you can put a mesh, a wire mesh underneath at the base of those raised beds to protect them from coming up and in because your roots can grow down through those meshes. So um, it is something that's easier to do when you're planning your garden before you already have it in, but oftentimes you might not know that you have these pest issues until you have a garden and you're ready to harvest something and then it's eaten by a, a wildlife friend. Um, there are some other ways to think about this too with like 
building ecosystems and thinking of, okay, well, you have a lot of voles. How can you bring more um, predatory birds? And of course, there's concerns if you have cats or small dogs or chickens, you don't want to do that. Um, but if you don't and you can, you know, you want to see more owls in your yard, our extension program definitely has an owl box making, um, I think it's a kit that they sell possibly. Is that what it is? Is it a kit, Mano, that they it's sell? Good. It's all they well, they have the plans if you want to build your own, or they will sell you one that's already all assembled. Mm -hmm. if, if you want to have an owl house in, in the farm, but they, it, I would not do that in a home. Uh, it, it requires, um, you know, a big space to do that, but yeah, they, they sell them or they will give you plans to build your own. So, okay. attracting owls and hawks can help with, with voles and even squirrels. Yeah. Um, anything else about microclimates we want to touch on? I know we could do a whole webinar just about microclimate. So I um, think it, that's a good thing for people. If you have specific questions um, about your own microclimate or details about a certain type of microclimate, send it in the chat or um, when we open up for Q&A in just a moment, you can- and Just a little reminder, uh, if people are not familiar with chat, at the bottom of your Zoom screen, if you're on Zoom, there's a little chat button. If you hit that, it will open up a chat box and then you can start typing a question in there. Thank you for providing that. I kind of overlooked that piece. Um, so now we'll get to the putting it all together. So one thing when we first um, were talking about this webinar, you know, my mind went to, well, when I want to plan my garden, I want to come up with this really, really beautiful colored illustrated design of a garden. And I tried to do that a couple of years. And I think if that is your style, if you are an artist, if you are an architect, if you are a designer, if you're a creative and you like to draw please do your garden design that way. It's really wonderful to see, but that's not how you have to do a garden plan. You can um, take a Sharpie marker or a pencil and do a very easy sketch. You can take a photo on your phone and put little markings on it. Um, you can just write it out if you, if you don't want to get creative with some type of sketch. But I just, I wanted to bring that up only because I know for me, I always felt like if I didn't have this really beautiful watercolor design, my garden would fail and I would try to do that. And then my garden wouldn't re be represented by that. And then I'd feel like- Another just... way to do a design is to go out in your yard after you've identified the, the different microclimates and you can use either a rope or a garden hose and lay it out to, to delimit the area where you think you want to be gardening. And personally, I like curves. So, you know, garden hose lends itself really well to making curves. So you can really see what it looks like if you're a visual person, mm -hmm. you, um, you know, yeah. out in the field. And I think, you know, for me, what's more important than a visualization of things is a calendar of when I'm going to do things. And I, my process is that I start at the end. So when do I want to harvest something or when do I want to can tomatoes or when do I want to dry mint and then backtrack it with, okay, well, if I want to can tomatoes on September 5th, you know, how many days do I need to get to that point? And then when do I need to actually start my seeds? And Minot has created, um, both Minot and Linnea Petty from the Hunger Coalition have created some calendar resources that really helps us in that process where it shows when to start seeds indoors or outdoors, when to transplant things into your garden. So I really like that methodology of looking at a calendar and then I kind of create myself a task list. So I know on March 1st or whatever day in March, here's what I plant then. And then I know that at a certain point, I'm gonna have to transplant those up before they go out into my garden um, around the 1st of June for tomatoes specifically. I think looking at it as like a calendar of tasks is a really nice way in my mind to see how much work I have. Um, maybe there's a couple weekends where I don't have a lot of work and I can go on that backpacking trip. And maybe there's a few weekends where I'll have a ton of work and I'm not going to be able to get outside into our beautiful valley, but I'll be in my backyard garden. Someone um, is asking where we can get the, that calendar. Uh, yeah, I will um, email you a link after... Yeah, it's going to be, 
in the in the follow up email to all the registrants. Um, and if you want it right now, you can go to 5bresiliencegarden.org. And I think it's the first or second bullet on our resource list there. We have lots of links on our website with these amazing resources that members of our community have created for us. Um, so thanks for that question. And yes, we will share lots of resources in the follow-up to this along with our slides and the recording. Um, so one thing, and I think this is maybe Linnea who actually mentioned this a few years ago to me of like, start a journal. And when I hear start a journal, I imagine that I have to have pages and pages of pages and this whole process. It's just like, no, 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 just write a word down, write cold, <laughs> write rainy, you know, just write something. And I think that's I, been really powerful for me. I've been, I've been journaling since the beginning, uh, since I took my master naturalist class, which came before my master gardener's class. Uh, they really inspired me to start a journal and I still, and still have that journal. And it, it's a, it looks like this, it's a, it's, it's a ring thing. And uh, I don't write in it every day, but I write, especially when I start my seed. Oh, today I started my seeds. So mm -hmm. I can find out like how long, how long it took to, before they germinated. And mm -hmm. um, so, sometimes during the, the season, I will put a few notes, but I, I sp especially mark the beginning and the end. Like, oh, today I harvested so many things and I froze so much of it. And I made this recipe with this and I made this recipe with that. I made, mm -hmm. so I made, oh, next year, remind, I remind myself to make, you know, grow more cilantro because I love pesto and I want to make more of it. So I put notes like that in, in my uh, journal to, uh, to learn and, and mm -hmm. to, to remember. So oftentimes I'll go back, oh, what did I plant last year? Where did I plant it? Because I want to rotate. And if I didn't write down where I planted what, I don't remember because I'm getting old. I don't remember from year to year what I did last year. So I, I make sure I write it down and mm -hmm. it really serves me. And you can and, draw, you can make it artistic, you can make it. Right. It, it, and I think adding it, on to what you said about um, writing things down, this is not part of planning your garden officially because it'll be once you start doing your garden, uh, write things down label things, label what you've seeded, um, label your pots, label spaces in your garden where you've seeded things because um, as this garden, the photo here perfectly shows, there's no labels. So if I didn't record what I had written down, I might not remember the next year what was what was growing in that garden bed. Especially um, if, if you're saving seeds. Yep. Like once your plants go to seed, uh, the kale looks very similar to uh, the arugula and, and, oh, the carrots look like the parsley. It's like, well, what's what? <laughs> right, right. So it's and, and also when you preserve your food. I know for me, um, I'm not great at labeling things I freeze. And then I'll go in there, you know, in the middle of January and be like, this is either basil or it's cilantro. And then we might get cilantro in our pesto and basil in our refried beans, right? <laughs> And it's fine, but labeling things really helps you um, avoid those little mistakes. Um, and I think the last thing really about putting it all together is that this is a process. Um, every gardener has failures every year. Um, I think that is like on repeat in my mind. Like you can be, you can have all the knowledge in the world. You can have done all the planning in the world and gotten the best seeds and you can still have failures because this is, because we're part of nature. This is a natural cycle. Um, nothing is perfect. Nothing is exact. It's a little bit chaotic. And I think um, knowing that and using that as a practice of our own to really give ourselves grace. Um, I've learned that through gardening. And I think it's just, it's a good reminder, especially for if we have new gardeners on this call, if this is your first year gardening, you will definitely have failures and it's okay. And it's totally worth it. Just remember that um, when you're in the process and something bad happens, just know that all gardeners have experienced that. And most of us do multiple times per year. And if you've gardened elsewhere and it was so easy elsewhere and you come here and you say, nothing grows here. Well, yeah, there things grow here, but you have to be mindful 
of so many factors. You yeah. have to be willing to monitor. You have to be willing to use uh, devices to, pro to protect from, you have to be able to watch the, the weather forecast every night, see which night is gonna go. Below 40, my tomatoes don't like it. Below 30, mm -hmm. So this plant doesn't like it. I have to go out and cover it be before I go to bed. So, so it it requires some some uh, some mindfulness and and mm -hmm. willingness, but mm -hmm. it's so rewarding. And and many people grow a lot of food here. A lot of varieties that I thought could not be grown here are grown. Fruits, peaches, you know, pears, yep. peaches, uh, apples for sure, but. Um, a lot of things can grow here, pumpkins, melons, but it depends on your microclimate. Some people mm -hmm. who are closer to the river will have more success on some things than people who live closer to the mountain because the mountain, the cold air comes down the mountain into the canyon onto your property if you live close to the mountain. So you have a different microclimate than someone who lives by the river has more, moist, moist, more moisture and uh, uh, more temperate temperatures. Yeah. So I'll share just some additional resources. Um, one, I'd like to say, following up to what Mano said, gardening is easier um, when we work in community together, when we share resources, when we share ideas, when we share experiences with each other. So um, 5B Resilience Garden is here to help you have success in gardening and also to use you to share your successes with other people in our community. Um, but if you're looking for additional support outside of what our resources can provide you, first and foremost, you can hire someone locally. We have some amazing landscaping companies and landscape architecture in our architects in our community um, that you, if you have the budget for it, you can hire them and they can bring your dream garden to life. You can hire an architect who can design your garden for you. You could hire a landscaping company who can actually do the weeding and the watering for you. Um, just throwing it out there as some opportunities. If you really want a garden and you don't have the skill set, but you do have some resources to spend on it, there's some great people here in our community who are probably very busy, but I'm sure they would love any additional um, contacts. Um, also, our University of Idaho Extension has a vast publication list on their website. Um, we'll be sure to include that link in the follow-up, but they go in depth on a lot of different subjects. So it's a good resources resource to have. Um, there are I some- have, I have several books uh, that uh, are really good for high altitude gardening at high altitude. Rocky Mountain Gardening. Mm -hmm. There are many books. Uh, that's a great way to, to learn. Yeah. And so the book I put on here is more about planning your garden. Um, Mano kind of mentioned it earlier that there are these online tools or book related tools that will say, you know, what size is your family and how many plants do you need to grow? And this, the family garden plan is one of those kind of workbook um, tools. And I think she does have a digital version of that as well. Um, and then in the middle, we show a photo of like an online or digital app. This one's free. It's gardeners.com. It's their kitchen garden planner. And you can create your own visual of your own garden here and plug in what you want. And it even gives you kind of planting tips. They won't be specific to our region, but they're a really nice way to kind of get familiar and, and see what kind of things you can mix together in your garden. Um, there's also the, a great Google search. We're in a time when we have everything at our fingertips. So if you have a question and, and you don't have a neighbor to ask, just ask Google and you'll find treasures. Yeah, yeah, that's very true. Um, okay, so we'll, as of now, we'll open it up. I'll kind of stop sharing my screen so people can jump on and show us their face and ask us questions. Um, but just a reminder, this was recorded. We will share this with everyone who registered after the fact, along with additional um, links and resources that we've discussed. We do have a Facebook group. It's a private Facebook group for gardeners to connect with each other. So you can find that the 5B Resilience Garden group is available for anyone to join. And you can email us at gardens at sunvalleyinstitute.org with any questions, feedback, comments, ideas, um, things like that. So with that, I will stop my screen share and we will officially go into our Q&A round. So let's see what's going in the chat. 
And um, I have a little plug here for the Hunger Coalition. It, that's a great way to learn about gardening is to volunteer for the Hunger Coalition. Or uh, we also started a community garden at the Grange last year. And uh, we hold workshops there and we have a few work days there where you, you can come and we do a specific task and you can learn about gardening or building compost bins or installing irrigation uh, systems or whatever. We have these, we'll have these workshops throughout the, the growing season. Yeah, thank you. So I just added the link to the calendars. One was created by Mano, one was created by Linnea. I think the one created by Linnea is also available in Spanish on that link. Um, so we do have another question. How do you test your soil to see what's missing? I'll let you start with that, Mano, and then I can add in. Okay, my, my first test uh, as a small gardener, my first test is I try to grow something and see if it grows, <laughs> okay? If it grows, fine, maybe I don't need a test. If it doesn't grow and I have difficulty, maybe I should be testing. Uh, the extension office can help you with that. The extension office will tell you how to collect samples of soil in your garden, and they'll even uh, lend you a tool to collect your sample. And you can send in that sample through the mail to a company that they will identify to you. And, um, and then you'll get a report back. And once you get the report back, if you need help with interpreting the results, you can, the, the extension agent will be there to help you. Um, so that's, that's a way to find what's in your soil. Uh, the best way to know what's in your soil, grow your own compost. Add your own compost to your soil, and then you'll know what's in your soil. Good compost. Yeah, and I would just add to that. Um, I think a lot of home gardeners find soil testing to be really um, hard to utilize, right? Hard to interpret, hard to actually know what that means. A lot of soil tests are made for commercial growers who might have access to different products, like mm -hmm. applying just copper right to their soil and I think um, while if that's your style where you really want to know what's in your soil go ahead do a soil test I haven't done one and I grow great stuff every year I am going to be done one personally <laughs> I am going to be moving I'm going to be uh, hopefully moving cross our fingers that everything goes through with our home um, but we'll be moving into a place that was at one time agricultural land so I might do a soil test just to see what's going on um, but and I don't think I would have to. And you'll probably move your fertile soil with you, I bet. Me, yes, yes. And we have some other fun things that we're working on with soil building. Um, you know, I think cover cropping and mulching are things that we didn't talk about specifically in this, um, just because of the topic of this webinar itself. But you can build healthy soil with really minimal inputs without ever doing a soil test. Um, not to downplay what soil tests can tell you, but you don't necessarily need it to know how to feed your garden, what it needs to thrive. Unless you're, you know, you see some, it's not growing or there's something. Right, wrong. yeah. Yeah, if, you, if you've tried and everything dies or you have like everything's growing well, but you have this one spot that's really strange, you could test that soil. Um, maybe it was where, you know, a gas can sat for a while and there's some residues or something like that. Um, some people think that acquiring soil from a company will be better quality than your own soil. That may not be the case. Yeah. And I uh, will say any soil can be, you know, take what you have and enrich it with compost, aerate it, water it, mulch it, protect it, love it. Plant in it. <laughs> you know, the, the roots themselves of plants, whether you eat them or not, the roots are feeding the microbiome of the soil and that's generating life in the soil and healthy soil has life in it. Um, I know that's she that, our, our, needs humidity. So keep the soil humid. Don't let your, your soil go so dry that it kills all the microbiome in it. Yeah. And if you, so the, the person who asked our question um, added a little bit to it that they just need a boost. So my recommendation, if you don't have your beautiful homemade compost, like Mino does, 
Um, I think vermicomposting, and we have a great company locally called Whitehead Worms that they will come and they will apply vermicompost for you, or they will sell you a bag of dried uh, vermicompost. That is a great way to add nutrients to your garden itself and also to spark that microbial activity. So if you want to boost that to me, that is the number one bang for your buck, in my opinion. Any, any source of organic matter will boost your, your soil. Yeah. And another thing is avoid tilling too much or, or don't till at all. You can aerate your soil by using a fork that just goes in the ground and you just like break the ground and like I like to say fluff it a little bit, but you don't turn it over and, and bring the fertile undersoil or the bacteria that are deeper come to the surface, the surface is drier and has less microbiome than three inches below. So don't turn it around <laughs> to have a richer microbiome. You just add air to it, make sure. And one way to add air to it is to grow things, grow, to, grow potatoes in, in a place that is, is not so good. And the, the potato roots will, will create the aeration add worms, add, add a lot of compost with worms in it, the worms will, will aerate your soil. Even ants will aerate your soil. I would not say to invite your ants in your garden though. But if you have ants, you can convince yourself that they're not annoying by reminding yourself that they aerate your soil like I do, because I have ants. And they've dissipated as we've built our healthy soil. They're constantly being pushed out to the edges, right? Where our soil's not so great along a fence line or where our dogs dig it up, right? Um, and it's really interesting to see them spread and basically they're edged out by the health of the soil. Yeah, yeah the, it's the fascinating. ants will not live where you water every day. So they, right. they're going to eventually get away from there. Yeah. Thanks for the question, Diana. Um, I'm glad you felt like that uh, was sufficient advice. Um, it's always, you know, everyone kind of has their own way of looking at it. And I know a lot of people really recommend soil testing, but you have two gardeners here who have never tested their soil and have very thriving gardens. So it can be helpful. It's not necessary. If, any, um, if anyone wants to ask a question, you can unmute yourself and just go ahead and ask your question. Yes. Yeah. The rest of this session will be Q and A. So I know we've had a couple people jump off. Um, feel free to leave if you're, you know, if you need to get to dinner or do whatever it is that happens in your evenings. Um, but we'll stay on and answer questions as long as people have questions coming our way. So, yes, Nick. None. Oh, a couple of comments on uh, your great presentation. You were talking about leafy greens for summertime after lettuce and spinach have kind of run their course. Uh, amaranth and uh, auroch and Egyptian spinach are three really good ones that to grow here in the summertime um, yeah. if you want to have leafy greens. So I'll mention that. Uh, you were talking about a deer fence and the, the most efficient way to build a deer fence is to just have a conventional four foot fence and then offset horizontally from the top wire of your four foot fence, put a one wire out that is horizontally a foot or a foot and a half away from your top wire. This is a much less expensive way to build a fence. The deer comes up now to that single wire that's a really keeps it a foot away from the fence and it realizes it can't jump and clear the, uh, the fence. So. That's something for if someone wants to build a deer fence. Um, I'd also say plant by soil temperature. You mentioned having a soil thermometer. I think that's probably one of the most valuable tools a gardener can have. And plant by temperature rather than by date. Um, you, you, that will definitely give you better success. Um, I would urge everybody to start what they want to grow from seed. Don't buy starts. When you buy something that's been, been started in a plastic cup, it has about seven days optimum for transplanting. You plant, transplant something in a cup too early and um, all the soil falls away and you get root shock. 
you plant too late and almost everything you buy in a store is much too late. You pull the plant out, it's totally root bound. You've got to tear the roots apart and you're looking at two weeks of transplant shock before it's going to start to go. So while it's a bit intimidating, I think, especially to some new gardeners thinking of starting from seed, it'd be so much easier just to buy the plant. I really urge people to, to start from seed and the best way to do that with soil blocks. And um, uh, I'd be happy to talk to anybody about soil blocking it if they, if, if they want to learn about that. Hey, Dick, maybe um, what we could do is I could come down and do a little video of soil blocking in your greenhouse. Because well, you, you got a great setup down there and that'd be really fun to do. Yeah, I would, I would offer to put on a soil blocking class, except for what we're in here with the, you know, social distancing and everything like that. But I'd be, I'd be very happy to work in any way with anybody to show them the benefits of soil blocking. And I think Manon's a big proponent of soil blocking now. I, uh, I think uh, last year, or was it the year before, Amy, that we, we did a was, class on soil blocks and we actually recorded that. So there- Yeah, there, it was two years ago. We do have, have the recording. It, it may be on my YouTube channel. Or... It might be in the Dropbox. Um, we can add it to the, to the resource list that we'll send out as a follow-up. Um, but I think a short video too, um, just showing like the quick process would be really nice for people as we've yeah. talked about, you know, we want the long ones and the short ones. So we capture all the attention stands out there. And that brings me to a question someone asked before the workshop, how, how do you successfully transplant uh, a plant that you started? Um, there are plants that are more sensitive than others. There are plants that will the, the label will say, do not start indoors, start it only directly in your garden. And I start them indoors anyway. And we have to do this here because our season is so short. But one way to help that is either use soil blocks because that reduces your transplant shock. Or you can also use a container that has no bottom. Like I, I would use a, a yogurt container cut the, the bottom and put it upside down. And so the, and I have the lid at the bottom so I can remove the lid at the bottom when I transplant. So I plant at the top on the smaller opening and, the, and it forms a, a slight cone, right? So when I want to transplant, I remove the lid which is underneath or if it's not a lid, it could be um, a paper cup that you cut the bottom and you put it upside down and you just have a piece of cardboard underneath. And when you transplant, you just move it to, the, to where you want it and you just slide your cardboard off and you just plop your plant down to minimize the shock to your root. You don't want to disrupt your root. So that, that's the way to successfully transplant. And as Dick said, you have to know when to transplant. You transplant mostly when when your uh, plant has two sets of true leaves after the little first little leaves that are called false, leaf, false leaves or cotyledon um, when, once you have two sets of real leaves then it's a good time to transplant um, and like tomatoes i start tomatoes either in march or early april and i transplant them two or three times into bigger and bigger pots to avoid the tomato plant going root bound in its little pot. So one, once I see that, oh, it's tall enough. Uh, okay, I, I give it a, a pot that's, that has two more inches in diameter. And then, oh, the weather is too cold. I can't transplant yet. I'll transplant yet in, into a, a bigger pot until I get to a point where I can transplant outside. Great. Um, we did uh, a little ways back in the chat and shared with us that, and I think this is a great idea, which is why I'm bringing it back up. It's creating your own microclimate. She says that she plants tomatoes in a wagon and they pull them into the garage every night, which is a big commitment. But I think 
um, depending on where you live in this valley, that might be your most successful way to get tomatoes. So um, think about that. If you have a wagon or you have smaller pots or something that's, you know, you can bring things in to protect them from the cold nights. Um, let's see what else is in. Oh, thank you, Michael. Really appreciate that feedback. Um, yeah, we're really, we really hope we can do some hands-on in-person workshops this summer. We will definitely do some. They might be just a couple of participants, um, but we will be kind of finalizing those dates in the next couple of weeks and getting that out to everyone um, with COVID restrictions as necessary. Any other questions, thoughts, ideas? Um, we have time. So if anyone like really wants to dive in deep with some of their problems that they're having or thoughts about planning their first time garden, jump in. We can discuss, we can workshop it together. <laughs> Someone was asking about squirrels specifically. Uh, yeah, the ground squirrels. So it, it's similar to voles. If you have a dog or, or you may want to acquire a dog or adopt the neighbor's dog and tell the dog, please <laughs> chase. It's a chase great idea. Over there. That, that's a good way. Uh, another way is to um, cover, cover the ground so they don't come and store their seeds in that ground and get you. Or um, you can put um, pebbles or gravel around your bulbs because I've noticed that if I plant bulbs or transplant bulbs, they go and eat them. <laughs> uh, but if you put gravel around your bulbs, they don't like the gravel or, uh, under their feet, so they won't go in there. So Great. that We did have two questions come in. Um, let's right. go with this one first. Um, not using herbicides. What do you do about quack grass weeding? Any suggestions, Mano? Uh, repeat the question. I don't. Um, if you're not going to be using herbicides, oh, uh, what do you do about quack grass weeding? How do you manage grasses Dick, that are weeds? Dick, do you have an answer to that? I remember you talked about that in the past. The quack grass. Yeah. The. the <clears throat> excuse me. First of all, the quack grass was going to make a sod and you can you can get a sod cutter and just remove all of the sod from the place that you're going to to eventually plant that won't get all the roots but that will get um the vast majority if you can just just take the sod off just um then then <clears throat> beyond that uh take cardboard and take say take your sod off and then in the place that where you have just the bare dirt now you'll still have some roots down in there take cardboard or good weed cloth but cardboard will work fine and uh, just cover that over for six weeks time and um, or more. <laughs> if it's in the if it's in the summertime yeah or more but you'll get a lot taken care of in, in six weeks by having it covered and not letting the sunlight get down to it. And if it's a small area or um, just go after the roots, you know, it, it takes time, but if, if you have the patience to go in, dig and remove the roots after a while, they'll, they'll get discouraged. And yeah. the same applies to bind weed. Some people say, oh, bind weed is terrible. Yeah, but don't, don't let it continue to proliferate remove everything that you see that is bindweed and once in a while you can go in and remove the roots from the soil if you have time but keep keep pulling it out don't don't let it grow and and say oh there's nothing i can do because <laughs> that will make it worse all right Thank great you. answers on that one um i really appreciate those steps dick i think that's really helpful for people in thinking about weeds i see elizabeth waving we're gonna let her ask her question on live video before we jump into this last question in the chat. Okay. It's so dark in here. I'm doing okay. I have two suggestions um, that have really helped me. For years, I tried to grow corn and tomatoes unsuccessfully in East Haven, 
with the mouth of the Freedom Village. <clears throat> and then what I did was rearrange my garden of a, a fountain in the center that's set in the midst of, I think, nine big two by two tables that are set right butted to each other. And then all of my beds are circular around that and everything in the whole garden is set into gravel. And the gravel is uh, reddish and I now am able to successfully grow lots of tomatoes and excellent corn, although it's probably cost me a dollar a, a, a cob of corn. <laughs> wow, and, that's a creative way of making a microclimate. Right. And it sounds beautiful too. Yeah, and beautiful. Yeah. The side of that is that it's harder to grow lettuce late in the season because I've warmed everything up so much. So all my lettuce and things are on the, the northeast side of the garden where cool air comes in off of that other side. My other suggestion, which has just changed my life, I think it's Gardener's Supply or Gardener's, Garden, yeah, Gardener's Supply. Um, they sell caterpillar tunnels that have wires in them and they're about 12 feet long and you can get them in a small size or ones that are about two feet high. But it's just a, an arch with um, um, plastic poly polyurethane over it and it just caterpillars out and you stick the wires into the ground. I have saved my corn now for probably five or six years from freezing. Um, I only have one freeze that goes through those caterpillar tunnels. They are worth every penny. They're not expensive. They also have shade cloth on these little wire arches that telescope out and um, they stick into the ground. The best money you've ever spent. Awesome, Elizabeth. Thank you for sharing. Sure. And maybe, Elizabeth, if you're open to it, people could look at your garden on display to get an idea for themselves. Sounds good. Or you could show some pictures if you want that route instead of um, welcoming people into your garden. Everybody can come. <laughs> Great. Thank you, Elizabeth. Um, I think this might be our last question, unless anyone else adds something here. Um, but someone asked, um, where can we get seeds from the seed library and share seeds with the seed library? So I'll let Mano mm -hmm. go into that because she's kind of managing. Now, the right question now. is, when, when can we get seeds? Yeah, when can we get seeds and share seeds? So we can. So yeah. uh, because of COVID procedures, the seed library is pretty much in my living room and on my table, under my table, in my closets, everywhere. My house is, is a library right now. So uh, we're still in the process of accepting seeds. People keep giving us seeds. And um, last year, our procedure was people were emailing me and I was preparing their seed orders and putting it on the porch and they would come and pick it up. And this year, I'm, we're gonna try something a little different um, for the bulk of the seeds. We will try to distribute them in five different locations. So hopefully we will have one location in Cary, one in Bellevue, uh, one or two in Haley, and one in uh, Ketchum. And uh, we, I think that the timing will be probably end of February, beginning of March, when the seeds will be available in these places. And we will uh, inform you all when, when, it's, um, when the seeds are available. And, and can we just speak to what ki kind of seeds we'll have available? Because that question did come in. OK. And, um, and, and I want to say before that, that the, the seeds we will put in, this, in these distribution points will be the seeds that we have the most of or the most popular ones. And if you don't find the seeds you want in these uh, mini libraries that we will have, you can still email us at um, the Wood River Seed Library and, um, and we will be happy to prepare uh, seed packets for you and uh, what kind of seeds we can get. We will be posting uh, a list of all the seeds that we usually have. And we have a lot of seeds. We have pretty much any vegetable that you can think of that does grow here in our valley. We have melons, 
Uh, we have uh, various tomatoes, we have different kinds of greens, we have flowers, we have a lot of flowers that I had not even known. Uh, uh, we have medicinal flowers, we have herbs, uh, we have um, grains. Some grains. We have some grains. Uh, we have, what else do we have? Flowers, herbs, yeah, that's pretty much. We have uh, pretty much anything that you can grow here. Um, we have in the library. Last year, we were very lucky. We ran out of some seeds and we um, called on to a, a national seed bank and they mailed us some seeds. And the uh, Rocky Mountain Seed Alliance gave us some seeds and uh, Snake River Alliance gave us some seeds. The Hunger Coalition gave us their surplus of seeds and that restocked our library. The other thing I will say is sometimes on the envelope, we will have a date. Just know that seeds last a long time. Producers like you to think that, oh, these seeds are made for 2010. So if you're in 2012, you have to throw them away. No, that is not the case. Maybe they won't sprout as fast or maybe not as many of the seeds in the envelope will sprout, but most of the seeds will probably still be good. Yeah. So we will be posting, we will have a document that will include the list of seeds and we will uh, keep you informed on when, when the seeds will be out there in the libraries. The Haley Library will reopen their doors to our seed cabinet uh, this year. So uh, starting in March, uh, we will stop that cabinet. But if and you live in Ketchum or Kerry, we will we'll be very happy to have new, new places for you to pick up seeds too. And we will most likely do a seed swap of some kind again this spring. Um, you know, April weather 24. and COVID. Sorry, go ahead. April 24. We will have a, a, a seed exchange at the Grange. Like last year, we had one and it was very successful. We had a few producers also who came and sold us some of our, uh, some of the local starts and, and seeds. And, uh, and it was all, all out, outdoors. Uh, so April 24, we will have a seed exchange and uh, end of May, beginning of June, we will have another one for, especially for warm season things. Okay, I think that, you know, answers all of our questions that were here and that we received ahead of time. Um, this was a great session. I hope you all enjoyed it. I hope you learned something. I hope you were inspired. Um, we will keep posting these throughout the winter spring season. Um, we will also, as we shared earlier, work on some in person workshops so people can actually get their hands dirty and have some of these um, experiences building skills with some support of our experienced gardeners there. Cause I know that definitely helped me um, get more confident in what I was doing in my own garden. So. And feel um, free to email us too, if you have questions, yep. even after this workshop, email us, we'll be happy to yep. respond. And if you need consulting, I do consulting in my spare time. There you go. I, Plug I that. Doing that. So um, yeah, you can hire me. Uh, or uh, if you need a, a, a personal consult, and, or I can refer you to other people in the Valley who, who do consultations. And please call on to your neighbors and you know talk, talk to your neighbor. If you see a, a nice garden down the street, go talk to them. Yeah, yeah, it's a, it's a good bridge builder. Yeah. yeah. Um, Martha did ask, we did record this, Martha. Um, we will send this out as a recording to everyone who registered in advance. It will also, because we live streamed, it'll go up on our Facebook page pretty quickly here, I think. Um, I think there's just a quick process into turning that into an actual video on our Facebook. Um, once we have the recording done and sent out to registrants, we'll also post it on YouTube. So there'll be a myriad of ways for you to tune in um, to the earlier presentations. Yeah, so a few people came in late to the presentation, yeah. so you can watch the beginning or you can rewatch it all if you yeah. like. And we'll also send out slides because I know there was a lot of info on those slides. So that can be helpful too for people who missed the earlier presentations or want a little bit of a refresher. Those slides have lots of resources as well. Um, 
thank you all for being here. I think that's kind of it. Unless anyone wants to stay along. I think most people are jumping off now, but thanks for joining us. Um, enjoy your evening. I hope you all have a nourishing meal in your near future. And good dreams about gardens. Yeah. Yeah. Good dreams about gardens.